Jane Boleyn was only a Boleyn through marriage, but she had links to the royal court in a multitude of ways, sister-in-law to Queen Anne Boleyn and a lady-in-waiting to Queen Catherine Howard, and she even had some distant relation to the king, making her family quite active politically. Jane's reputation in history paints her as evil and a wicked wife, and some contemporary accounts note her as the infamous Lady Rochford stating she deserved her fate for the involvement which she had in bringing Anne Boleyn, as well as her own husband, to the block. But her reputation of being evil and spiteful only came in the years after her death. Jane Boleyn died on the 13th of February 1542, at the hands of the executioner on the scaffold on Tower Green, at the Tower of London. She was condemned to death for her part and involvement in the affair of Catherine Howard and Thomas Culpepper, a trusted courtier of King Henry VIII. Some believed that her death was a way of her past actions catching up with her. Lady Rochford, Jane Boleyn, was the widow of George Boleyn, brother to Anne Boleyn. Jane's part in history remains somewhat controversial, and the centuries have not been kind to her. History dictates that Jane Boleyn was a wicked and jealous wife who provided false testimony against her husband and sister-in-law testimony that enabled the deaths of Anne and George. Jane was born Jane Parker to Henry Parker, the 10th Baron Morley and Alice St John. The date of birth is unknown, but realistic guesses place it around 1505. Jane first met her sisters-in-law, Anne and Mary Boleyn, when she was chosen to have a part in a masked play in the court at 1522. Jane played the role of Constancy, Anne Boleyn was Perseverance, Mary Boleyn was kindness, and the king's sister, Mary, was beauty. Jane then went on to marry George at some point in 1524, it's believed, and two prominent families merged. Now there are rumours that George Boleyn was homosexual, but any evidence to prove this doesn't actually exist. Instead, the more accepted answer is that George, a self-proclaimed sinner, merely committed adultery and had an affair with another woman. Rumours circled that his marriage was unhappy, and the man responsible for any such rumours of homosexuality was in the employ of Cardinal Wolsey, George Cavendish, and Cavendish believed that the Boleyns were responsible for his master's downfall. Cavendish did not respect the Boleyns, so it's highly reasonable to believe that he lied and exaggerated about certain matters. It's believed that the real cause for tension between George and Jane was actually religion. David Lode states, There is no sign that Jane was anything other than strictly orthodox in her faith, and she had no patronage of any significance to indicate otherwise, while George was clearly in the evangelical camp. David Lode's The Boleyns, The Rise and Fall of a Tudor Dynasty, page 141. George, like his sister Anne, developed an interest in religious reform. But Jane, on the other hand, was a devout Catholic. Her father, Lord Morley, spent a few years in Margaret Beaufort's household. He was the mother of Henry VII. And he came to know John Fisher, who was executed in 1535 for refusing to accept Henry VIII as the supreme head of the church. Perhaps Jane's family, like many people in England, blamed Anne Boleyn for the executions of both John Fisher and Sir Thomas More. Jane and George married long before Anne even contemplated being queen, but Jane became a lady-in-waiting to Anne, and it's unknown how the two felt about each other. But that being said, Jane conspired with Anne against the king's new mistress, and she found herself banished from court for a time. This incident likely strained the relationship between the two women. Jane's presence is then recorded in court again in 1535, when the then Princess Mary had left Greenwich to go to Eltham, a great many women, in spite of their husbands, had flocked to see her pass and had cheered her, calling out that, notwithstanding all laws to the contrary, she was still their princess. Several of them, being higher rank than the rest, had been sent to the Tower. On the margin of that report, written by Dintervel himself, Note my Lord Rochford, the ambassador clearly meant that Lady Rochford was among those who had cheered Mary. This is taken from Anne Boleyn, A Chapter of English History, 
page 128 by Paul Friedman. Now it's believed that Jane may have felt torn between her family and her husband's family. Her loyalty and her beliefs were split. She was a Catholic and the bloody executions of individuals that she admired and looked up to like Bishop Fisher and Sir Thomas More would have shocked her to her core. This must have caused such a tremendous tension between Jane, her husband and the rest of the Boleyns. Jane then, according to local legends, became filled with jealousy, as her husband had such a close relationship with his sister Anne. And because of this, she gave a false testimony, a testimony that sent them both to their deaths. Wicked wife, accuser of her own husband, even to the seeking of his own blood. George Wyatt. Now, did Jane really testify against her own husband, against her sister-in-law, the Queen? In the reports and dispatches from the time, it states, That person who, more out of envy and jealousy than out of love towards the king, did portray this accused secret, and together with it the names of those who had joined in the evil doings of the unchaste queen. There's no mention about Jane Boleyn, only that the person is held responsible for Queen Anne Boleyn's downfall. At George's trial, it's reportedly said that on the evidence of only one woman, you are prepared to believe this great evil of me. Again, there was no mention of Jane, only a mysterious one woman. Bishop Burnet, who was probably the one who had access to contemporary sources that are now lost to us, stated that Jane carried many stories to the king or some about him. However, there is no contemporary evidence that names Jane Boleyn as her husband's accuser. She is not mentioned by name, and it was only years after her death that she became labelled as evil, wicked, jealous and spiteful. Now, Julia Fox states in her writing about Jane that once Anne Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth I, was queen, an explanation was needed for why Henry VIII had sent Anne to her death for treason and incest. Just as Elizabeth's mother, herself a Protestant icon by then, must have been innocent of the charges, the Queen's father, it was thought, would not have ordered Anne's execution unless he had believed her guilty. Now, conveniently, ignoring Henry's passion for Jane Seymour, it was easy to suggest that the king had been told lies, and that the person who had told the lies, it was alleged, was Jane, executed for the alleged treason, and with no one to speak for her, she then became the perfect scapegoat. It was a myth, it seems. Jane was a historical scapegoat for Henry VIII and his desire to be rid of Anne. After the death of George, Jane was in financial difficulty and she found herself asking for help from Cromwell. Henry VIII's right-hand man, beseeching him to obtain from the king for her the stuff and plate of her husband. The king and her father paid 2,000 marks for her jointure to the Earl of Wiltshire, and she is only assured of 100 marks during the Earl's life, which is very hard for me to shift the world withal. Praise to him to inform the king of this. Soon after this, Jane then found herself back at court as the lady of the bedchamber to Jane Seymour third wife to Henry VIII, and Jane then held this position with Henry's subsequent wives right up until her execution in 1542. Now Jane is falsely reported as admitting her guilt for giving false testimony against her husband, but actually according to a witness, Otwell Johnson, Jane only said the following, "'Committed many sins against God from my youth upwards, and have offended the King's royal majesty very dangerously,' So my punishment is just and deserved. I am justly condemned by the laws of this realm and by Parliament. All of you who watch me die should learn from my example and change your own lives. You must gladly obey the King in all things, for he, us, a just and godly prince. I pray for his preservation and beseech you all to do the same. I now entrust my soul to God and pray for his mercy." Jane was executed on the same day as Queen Catherine Howard, and Otwell wrote of them afterwards how impressed with their dignity he was. Their souls must be with God, 
for they made the most godly and Christian end. Jane was, after her death, given the label of evil, but perhaps it was just her own nosy nature that brought on her downfall. She did conspire with Anne Boleyn in order to get rid of the king's new mistress in 1534. She did show her support for the Lady Mary in 1535, when it was clearly a very risky thing to do, and she was briefly taken to the Tower on that account. And she helped a teenage queen, Catherine Howard, organise and facilitate her secret liaisons with Thomas Culpepper. But did she give false testimony against her husband and sister-in-law? I guess we'll never really know the truth. She was found guilty of high treason and taken to the Tower, where she suffered a nervous breakdown. Perhaps Jane thought that this last act of desperation would save her from the traitor's death, but she was wrong. Henry VIII was eager to put her to death, and he implemented a law that permitted the insane to be executed. Upon the scaffold, Jane showed no signs of being mentally insane. Instead, she faced her death with courage and dignity. Thank you for watching, and as a support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.